Thank you very much for coming back on time. I, I'm amazed by that discipline, so fantastic. So which will allow us to keep time. So we have a session with a pretty dry title called Banking, okay. But, uh, but I can tell you we have some two really interesting papers that will wake you up pretty soon, okay. So, um, uh, so I, I mean, I don't take much more time. So just introducing one of my colleagues, Darv Davide Porcelaccio, who has a paper on endangered bank fragility in a macroeconomy. He is one of our prolific contributors from the DG research with very nice interest in a research agenda on putting financial frictions and instabilities into macro models. Davide, you have uh, 25 minutes. Okay, so here it is. So let me start by thanking so much the organizers for including our paper. I'm very excited to present here. And I want to also start with an apology. So the paper has been growing very quickly lately. And so some of the things that quite a few of the things that I'll be presenting weren't in the, in the draft that we sent Ansgar. So yeah, there's a little ambush for him. Um, yeah, so this is joint work with Kevin, who's at the LSE. And yeah, obviously the paper is our views. It's not the views of the institution we, I work for. So, okay, so what am I going to do? I'm going to sort of uh, think about endogenous runs and find a way to insert them in. Uh, hopefully, by the end of this talk, I'll convince you to take the friction we have and put it in your favorite DSGE model. That's the idea. Um, and so what research questions can we, can we ask? So I'm going to be thinking about run risk. So. Well, sort of at the micro level, I can think of how does run risk affect banks' behavior? At a more macro level, sort of how does run, run risk affect you know, macroeconomic outcomes that we all care about? So, about? so let me give you sort of short answers to, to warm up. So on the, on the side of bank behavior, you know, banks are going to be worried about being too fragile. So they're going to leverage, they're going to limit their leverage. They're going to demand liquid assets. And uh, well, if they're fragile, they may end up having to pay funding spreads. And for macroeconomic outcomes, uh, these spreads will generate amplification to shocks. So things, there's a bad shock to the economy, funding spreads go up, that you know, further reduces investment. OK, so and then you know, once we have this model set up, basically we have real effects of liquidity. And we can ask ourselves, so. What are, what are the macroeconomic effects of government supplied liquid assets? And in particular, how should, you know, we can talk about optimal policy. How should the government supply liquid assets? Uh, well, the macroeconomic effects is that, you know, liquid assets, uh, once they're supplied, some of them end up on cushions on banks' balance sheets, and this supports lending in our model. Uh, and then we can ask her a question. So how and how much liquidity should be supplied? Okay, so let, let's start with some motivating evidence too. Uh, so the first one is that, yeah, bank funding spreads are gonna be at the heart of the mechanism of our model. Um, they fluctuate. Uh, they, they, you know, I don't have to tell this audience that they are sometimes thought of as barometers of financial stability. And because I don't have to explain this to this uh, audience, I'm just gonna skip over that. And something is said that is, I think, a little bit newer is, uh, a correlation that we find in the data between bank funding spreads, that is the LIBOR rate, so the rate at which banks can borrow at an uncollateralized basis, minus the repo rate, that is a safe rate. Uh, these are correlated positively with liquidity premia. So it seems like, uh, and so let me point your attention to the scale on the axis. I mean, that, that regression line that you see, that is steeper than it looks. Uh, um, and uh, so, this, this uh, presentation is going to be about coming up with a theory for that. And then we're going to do some empirical exercise. And this is just a correlation. We're going to try to identify that relationship. Um, OK, so let me just show you that the, the red dots, those are recessions. The black dots, those are expansions. So this relationship still seems to hold even in expansions. Um, yeah, maybe I should tell you what's, what's the story that we have in mind. The story is that in periods when liquidity is expensive, banks are going to reduce their liquidity buffers. And that's going to make uh, the credit risk of banks seem higher to, the, to investors. People are going to be worried that these banks have lower liquidity buffers. And so they're going to demand a higher uh, funding spread. 
Okay, so this is just again, the blue line is what I've shown you at the beginning. This is the regression line. I mean, that's just a correlation. And uh, at the end of the paper, I'm gonna try to persuade you that we have some exogenous liquidity shocks. And so the IV is the red line. So I'm, I'm gonna try to persuade you that there's actually a structural relationship between these two things. And it's yeah, pretty strong. Okay, so what's the literature? Obviously, there's quite a few macro banking papers. Um, yeah, just quickly, we have a different friction. So here we're gonna have run risk. Those papers, they're focused more about solvency. Um, the run risk, obviously, there's a, there's a literature uh, in banking theory. They we're gonna try to do this in general equilibrium. And um, a, a key outcome of the model is gonna be this demand for liquid assets. Demand for liquid assets, you know, you wanna hold a liquidity buffer just to reassure your creditors that you're not fragile. Uh, there's other papers that uh, sort of study demand for reserves and have models that, that give this as an outcome. They just tend to, you know, this demand for reserves tends to come from payment motives, or uh, ours comes from this run risk endogenously. Okay. Now, what's the roadmap? So the first thing I'll do, I'm going to give you one slide on micro theory, and that uh, it took quite a bit of uh, of uh, reducing. It's now only in one slide, and please. Forgive me for that. Um, then I'm gonna, I'm gonna have the friction, I'm gonna introduce it in the macro model. I'll show you how to do that. Then um, we're gonna do a, kind of a quantitative exercise and see you know, whether this friction matters, and then I'll, I'll move on to the identification, to the empirical evidence. Okay, so here's the micro theory. Please bear with me. So in each period, we're gonna have banks. Banks have, you know, the, state the key state variable is the net worth of banks here and they're gonna make two decisions. They're gonna choose their liquidity ratio, so how much government paper to hold relative to their total assets. I mean, the alternative to, government, to holding government paper is to hold physical capital, and I'm gonna call that the illiquid asset. Um, and they're gonna also choose how much to leverage. That's gonna, you know, that's gonna end up giving you a capital ratio. So net worth over total assets. And you know, banks make these decisions. The households on the other side, they have to decide whether they wanna hold or not uh, deposits. Now, I mean, I'm going to say banks and deposits here. I think the deposits need, you should have in mind uninsured deposits or short-term debt, and banks maybe we can think about a wider category. It's just easier to say banks instead of financial intermediaries each time. Okay, so just usual Diamond and Divic stuff, um, you know, illiquid assets, if you have to sell them on short notice, there's some liquidation cost. And that means that if too many households decide they don't want to hold your debt, then you go under as a bank, okay? And you'll be thinking, well, Diamond Divic, there's multiple equilibria here. And that's true. We get multiple equilibria, so we need a fr another friction. So we're going to put in a coordination friction. This comes from the global games. So the glo uh, global games literature has taught us how to do it. Uh, all you need, is, you, you don't really need an information friction. All, uh, I mean, you... People can know the fundamentals of the economy arbitrarily well. What's key here is that you, you need some uncertainty about what information others have. So you need creditors to be unsure what other people are thinking. So a departure for common knowledge. If you do that, then you get a, a unique equilibrium. Uh, so the unique equilibrium is nice to do policy analysis and to study the dynamics of the economy. Okay, and the unique equilibrium that ends up giving, it boils down to this no-run condition. Okay, so what this no-run condition is, uh, is telling us is that uh, households will decide not to run on the bank as long as they are sufficiently uh, remunerated for holding the debt. That is the left-hand side, the funding spread. J, you can think of as the LIBOR rate, so the re return on, on uh, banks' short-term uncollateralized debt. And raw, you can think of the risk-free rate, okay? Um, and uh, sort of what does remunerated enough mean? So the term to the right, that is the first theta, that's a parameter. It's the loss given default. If you're caught up in the bank's default, then you're going to lose that much of your principal. And the rest, that is a term that we call bank fragility. Uh, it, it basically functions uh, from the point of view of households as uh, the probability of default of the bank. And you can see that the bank can do something about that. The bank can uh, reduce its bank fragility by having more cap a higher capital ratio, that's a small n, or by having a higher liquidity ratio, that's a small m. Okay? And so that's going to be the key. Um, and that is the friction. And now let's 
try to put it in our macro model. And let's keep it as simple as we can. So the simplest macro model that we can th could think of was an RBC model. But this is just for illustration purposes. You can take that, that inequality constraint and put it in whichever new Keynesian model you prefer. Um, but yeah, let me just quickly go over what happens in an RBC model. There's going to be these households. They save in bank debt. They're going to supply labor, and they consume. There will be competitive firms. They rent the physical capital that the banks invest in, and they hire the labor. And there's going to be a government that supplies liquid assets. Uh, you can think of them as treasuries or reserves, sort of equally. And uh, there, in the background, there's going to be lump sum taxes and transfers to sort of support the, the debt. OK. now. Out of the way, the, the rest of the macro model, let's think about how does a bank behave within this macro model. Okay? So the bank is uh, an entity that, that is going to maximize its lifetime dividends, uh, has an infinite horizon, so present discounted value of dividends, is subject to budget constraints, and to that no-run condition that I, that I specified earlier. Um, there's, there's an additional thing that you always need in these microfinance model, a minimum dividend payout that is just for the, these banks not to be able to sort of run out of, um, escape the no run condition. I'll, I won't talk about, about that uh, today. Yeah, let's. So, what is the key trade off that this bank um, faces when it takes its, both its liquidity and its leverage decision? So, the thing, so let's talk about the liquidity decision. So, Liquidity has a lower return than other assets, so it's going to accept lower return if it holds more liquidity. On the other hand, uh, it reduces fragility, as we've seen earlier. So it reduces its funding costs. That's a trade-off. Instead, on the leverage, well, you know, if you lever up, you can get more of those returns in the market, and the physical capital has extra returns. On the other hand, uh, um, if you lever up, we've seen it earlier, fragility goes up, and then your funding spread goes up. So those are the trade-offs. And let's see what the first order conditions look like. OK, so the liquidity choice, it's this equation. It's linking the funding spread with the liquidity premium. So what that is saying is if, the, if liquidity is expensive, the liquidity premium is high, you will economize on your liquidity ratio. And then that will mean high, paying a higher funding spread. That's why they're positively related in, in equilibrium. Um, and then the other thing we get is we get this supply of physical capital. That comes from the decision of these banks. And all I want you to notice is that M, M is the government paper that is supplied to the economy. Uh, M, so you can think of it, like I said, reserves and treasuries. They are going to crowd in capital, OK? Because you know, if there's more uh, treasuries or reserves, then these liquidity ratios are larger, funding spread are smaller, and it's easier to invest. OK. So that is, that is it for the macro model. Now we have to close it with policy. Uh, so we have a model with real effects of liquidity, right? As, we, as we've seen earlier. They, liquidity reduces spreads and uh, sort of promotes investment in the economy. So, so we can think about optimal policy here. And actually, the op the, 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 there's a simple optimal policy uh, that is to just Print so or create so much liquidity that spreads become zero. Okay, uh, and but there's a but there. Uh, we're not going to do. That. We're not going to go with this. And there's some problems with it. So the, what do you need if you want to implement that? Is you're going to need to produce infinite amounts of of reserves or treasuries in this economy. So that that seems tricky. You're also going to have some fiscal cost. So of course it means also that a liquidity premium becomes zero. So it's going to be more expensive to issue debt in that economy. And another problem is that you know, these banks are making money out of those spreads. If there's no spreads, there's no money for banks to make. So you're going to end up in a steady state with zero bank net worth. So we, said, we think this is, this is not reasonable to, to, to think of this model in this way. So the way we're going to write policy is, is more modest. What, the, what policy is going to do is it's going to stabilize spreads, that is. And, um, so you're going to, if there's a shock to this economy, you'll respond by supplying liquidity. Uh, and uh, what's the point of that? The point is to mitigate, mitigate that amplification mechanism that we have in mind. OK. Uh, right, so now we're moving into the quantitative part. Uh, so the left table, those are moments in the data that we're trying to target. Um, 
the only one that is sort of different from the usual macro banking literature is the fourth, the liquidity premium. So what we're saying, we're trying to target sort of the average from 80, uh, 1986 to 2008 liquidity premium that is defined as the difference between the repo rate, uh, safe, uh, risk-free rate, minus the T-bill rate, okay? And it was 24 base points. So that is how we, that is what we calibrate the model to. That is, is gonna pin down sort of our liquidity policies. Uh, obviously things have changed since 2008, that's gonna be smaller now, but we wanna study sort of the world how it was before 2008 and see sort of, uh, I guess one of the questions that we can answer is, do we wanna go back to that? Um, Okay, and it gives us, I mean, as you can see to the right hand side, the only sort of novel parameters that we need over sort of our usual RBC parameters are the first three, and that those we can pin down with, um, with the targets that we have on the left side. Um, okay, so let's jump into the IRFs. So, so I'm gonna study, I mean, this is a shock that is often used to think about financial crisis because it, directly impacts the net worth of banks. So first thing I'd like you to, to focus on the dashed line. That is what happens after a capital destruction shock in an RBC model. So in an RBC model, you see capital stock goes down 5% because for some reason, you know, housing in the US lost value, right? Um, but net worth doesn't matter. Uh, and neither does liquidity in an RBC model. And you see spreads, they don't, they don't change at all. There's, they're not really, I mean, they're pinned down at zero. And you see, I mean, things that you think, I mean, GDP falls and uh, the banking sector tries to invest to build back up the capital stock. Now, what we have now, that is the, that is the red line, you see the capital stock is, the capital shock is going to destroy some net worth. So what happens is that spreads go up. Okay, that is the financial friction in action. And the financial friction in action means that investment goes down, it becomes much harder for banks to finance the recovery. Okay, and you see that GDP goes down quite a lot more and the distance is persistent, right? Um, another thing that happens in this economy is that after the shock, banks' profits go down considerably, right? Because it becomes harder for them to fund themselves so their intermediation margins go down. And that's why the shock is so incredibly persistent. You see, like, for years, these spreads remain high. Okay, so this is instead a thing that I can't even show you what an RBC model, uh, a shock that I can't even show you what an RBC model would do, because there's no point in, because there is recurrent equivalence in an RBC model, there's no, no action following an increase in, in the supply of liquid assets. But I can talk about it in our model. Okay, so what happens, uh, you see liquid assets go up a lot, that's kind of the shock. So what happens is that all these premia go down, right? There's more liquidity, so the liquidity premium goes down, and then all this liquidity ends up on bank's balance sheet, so their funding spread goes down. Lower funding spread also means that it's easier for banks to lend, so the credit spread goes down, and you see GDP goes up and investment goes up a lot. Okay, so that's the mechanism of the model. Okay. So we've gone through all the theory. I showed you some correlations in the beginning. Now let me try to convince you, hopefully, that you know, there's actually something in the data. So the question then is, does liquidity actually reduce these spreads? Um, OK, so let's see what we do. So we're going to run an OLS on daily data. It's going to be very important that the data is daily. And we're regressing spreads on treasuries, on outstanding treasuries. In the US, there's data on outstanding treasuries day by day. Okay, I mean, we're gonna have a bunch of controls, we're gonna have a lot of lags. I mean, this stuff is incredibly persistent, right? So you need a lot of lags there. And we're gonna have dummies to, de to deseasonalize, I mean, within the year, so weekday, day, month, and uh, we're gonna have dummies for recessions, and then we also have a linear trend to detrend. Right, so what's the identification here? So the identification, well, the graph is, is, is kind of small, so I, I, I don't know how much you can see of it. So the graph, the point of this graph is to tell you that um, the government in the US, this is an institutional feature, they, they, the auction for uh, debt takes place a few days before the issuance. We're gonna be focusing on issuance. But, so what this means is that the government, uh, uh, the treasury, cannot react to, to shocks today by issuing more um, 
more treasuries today, which is what the model would say that would have to do. But for institutional features, it takes a few days. Okay? So, so what, how does that help us? So the first thing it does is it uh, sort of um, it rules out reverse causality, right? Because it cannot possibly react to a daily shock to spreads okay, within the same day. The other thing that it does, it, it clears out our results of uh, information effects. So why is that? Because if you identify uh, you know, the daily innovation to treasuries, that is sort of an innovation to me as an econometrician, but everybody in markets knows with at least a day of advance how many treasuries there will be out tomorrow, right? So there is, to the issuance, there is no information there. The information is out on the day of auction, which happened a few days before. Um, and yeah, then the third is that, you know, we try our best to have a VAR setup where all the lags that are gonna capture the persistence, yeah, that is, uh, we hope that that does a good job. Okay, so this is just uh, telling you how you should think, another way of thinking of the, of the regression. So these are, I argue that we're gonna have these innovation to treasuries and that those are exogenous, that is the regressor. And on the, on the Y side, on the left side, you're gonna have uh, um, sort of the outcome variable that we're interested in, I'll tell you what they are, and the lags and the dummies are there to give you sort of a benchmark against which to calculate the residuals. Okay, so let's look at these. So it looks indeed like increases in treasuries on a day-to-day -day basis, like these innovations, they do reduce spreads. So we find that the, uh, well, the way you would read this is a 1% increase in treasuries is gonna reduce the funding spread by 1.7 basis points. And it's gonna reduce the liquidity premium by 1.7 basis points. I mean, there's no reason why these numbers have to be the same, they just so happen to be. And uh, another thing that goes in the direction of our model is that we find that there is a positive effect on the risk-free rate. The risk-free rate, uh, mind you, is the repo rate. Um, and so, as in our economy, sort of more liquidity crowds in investment, right? And if there's more demand for saving, as economists, we think that the interest rates would tend to go up. Okay, so, well, a bit uh, early, so let me conclude. So what have I done today? So I've uh, presented a macro model and I put in a new ingredient that is bank fragility. Um, I told you about the coordination game that gives us the friction. So the, th the reason why banks wanna avoid being fragile is that it drives up their funding costs and they have two ways to do that. They, they can either lever down or sort of try to control their level of le their leverage or you know, hoard a lot of liquidity. That is gonna bring down fragility and therefore funding cost. Um, and that's where the trade-offs are gonna come in. The macro model, so what it delivers that I think is novel is uh, a demand for liquid assets by banks that are worried of being fragile. Um, and it, it gives us this amplification and propagation of shocks via the spreads. Um, and yeah, so we can think about in terms of policy. So what does liquidity do in this economy? Well, it supports bank lending and therefore supports economic activities. So that's, uh, I think that's, that's what we want. Um, then, then we do a quantitative, quantitative exercise. The effects we find are pretty big. So this capital destruction shock is gonna be amplified by 40% and made much more persistent. And in the end, we did some empirical evidence that it looks like indeed, yeah, liquidity shocks reduce spreads. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we should have a prize for people who, who finish their presentations before <laughs> time. So you would have won it by wide margin. <laughs> um, so the, the discussant is Ansgar Walter from the Imperial College in London. Uh, you know Ansgar by now also, who has impressed us with um, various contributions to financial economics um, in the last few years in prudential field and several other fields. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Thank you for having me. Uh, so I've been ambushed. Uh, the correct response to an ambush is normally to, to run away, right? Um, but I will, I'm an academic, so I'll respond by, by talking. So um, <laughs> I have my discussion. I'll, I'll point out the things that I'm gonna say on the fly in response to some of the new facts, okay? So, but the facts in the version that I saw that motivated the exercise were basically that in financial crises, we see dramatic increases in credit spreads and afterwards, large and persistent real effects. These are sort of very well-known facts. Lots of, I'm not even citing people here, lots of people showed those after 2008. Now, 
The extra fact is that the supply of liquidity matters, right? So the, the, the spreads, as well as, uh, you know, the, the treasury rate are affected by supply and liquidity. That's sort of fact number three that you should add in your mind over there from the new version. Right now, we have lots of explanations of this stuff as well, right? So why would credit risk? Why would credit spread spike? It could be just even if you hold, you know, the risk aversion of the market constant, they might spike because there's just been an increase in the likelihood of distress or default. And so there's just increased credit risk out there. Now, there's also lots of evidence that risk aversion or risk premia in the market are counter-cyclical, right? So for various reasons, for example, habits or intermediary-based asset pricing or fire sales or that sort of thing, risk premia might go up for a given level of distress risk in a crisis, right? So both of them would speak for higher spreads in a crisis, and I think we have a pretty good understanding of, of what's happening there from various perspectives. There's also a behavioral perspective that people just psychologically become more risk averse in a crisis, and that's also probably valid. Uh, in terms of the large and persistence real effects, there is any number of microfinance papers looking at amplification. You know, flight to safety is a thing that was studied first in the 80s by Bernanke and co-authors. We've since had a lot of development there, but basically through bank or expert, more generally net worth, a lot of these shocks get amplified when people face financial constraints and have to fire sell their capital, and then they're even poorer, and then they have to fire sell even more, and so on. You have all these spirals going on, right? So we kind of have a story for this. Um, I'm wondering if we have a story for the link between treasury supply and, and prices. I was thinking about sort of the older literature on, you know, inside and outside liquidity. There's a, a lot of studies by Holmstrom and Tyrol, for example, on that topic where, you know, liquidity supply combined with financial constraints in the spirit of some of these other papers does give you a link between liquidity supply and prices. You know, it's kind of not shocking that in a world where people face financial constraints, supplying something very safe that people can hold and use to pledge as collateral uh, changes the way the assets are priced and might alleviate a crisis. But what's new here is that you can sort of rationalize all that stuff at the same time using the threat of debt runs or bank runs. Okay, I should be clear here that this model is kind of about banking. But a lot of the people that ultimately lend to banks, especially the uninsured lenders to banks, tend to be also institutions, right? They tend to also be people that are subject to balance sheet constraints of some kind. So I think some of these explanations still apply. But here's a new one based on the threat of runs. Okay, so something very quick on, on the theory of runs. This is in Diamond and Dibvik, runs are just a sunspot, right? They can happen whenever, wherever, for no reason. You switch from the good equilibrium to a panic. Global gains are attractive because they're more in line with history. History tells you bank runs don't just happen out of the blue. They tend to happen when there's some bad news. Right? So the simplest version of the bank run global gains version uh, was in a, in a paper by Morris and Shin in 01. It basically just says that you're going to get a good equilibrium, i.e. no run, whenever the fundamental value of your assets exceeds some threshold. The NPV has to be not just positive, but it has to be above some threshold that measures how strong the strategic complementarity between depositors is. And so basically, you know, that gives you runs in bad times. But I think the literature has had a love-hate relationship with this, because as soon as you put this into more realistic models, global games tend to become a mess. It's very hard to solve this stuff, and, and you, you hardly ever get clean characterizations. Enter Davide and Kevin, who have a very clean characterization. And they go through a lot of effort to hide this really clean equation, um, which I think summarizes what happens. OK, so you have capital K, which is illiquid. So let's discount that by, by a factor lambda, which measures the illiquidity. You have money M. And so that together, lambda K plus M, is sort of your amount of liquid assets, roughly speaking, in a, in a weighted way. Right? Now, let's say only a fraction f of your debt gets rolled over. You have, to keep, you have to make sure that your liquid assets are greater than 1 minus f times your debt. And that's exactly the condition in the paper. If that doesn't hold, you get a run. Right? So basically, when you face the risk of a run, you have a flight to safety. You prefer m over k. And you get amplification again via the net worth. Right? Once you have to do that, you hold more M and less K, and you earn lower returns on your investments, and then you, you can invest less in the future, and you're even more close to the run constraint. 
So this is kind of neat. I, I thought this is kind of the main selling point is to, to get something so tractable and so realistic. This is exactly what we think about when we think about liquidity regulation, etc. I think it's very nice. I would compare it a little bit to the literature on fire sales that I've worked on a bit more. You know, suppose you're a person who needs to roll over one minus F times your debt next to next period. So basically only a fraction F of your debt is, is long term and the rest you have to roll over. And you can borrow up to a fraction lambda k of your capital. This is more like a Kiyotaki Moore style model where you can borrow up to a fraction of your, of your assets, right? And you also have some M. Now, what is the constraint that you have to satisfy to avoid having to sell your capital to unproductive outsiders? Uh, exactly the same thing, right? So, sort of observationally equivalent, you can get in the fire sale models, you get a flight to safety, you get amplification via the N. Uh, what you don't get in the bank run version, and you do get with fire sales, is that the distress actually sometimes happens in equilibrium, right? You do see fire sales in these models and they generate an externality, a pecuniary externality that's not properly priced, so you have too many fire sales. Okay, whereas in David's model, for a given stock of government supply of liquidity, everything's fine. All the banks make sure they satisfy the no-run constraint and we never actually see any distress. Right, so the fire sales model are a little bit different. And I wanna push you to sort of, you know, test your models against alternatives a little bit more, and this would be one of them that, that you might consider. Another thing that's nice, this is sort of just selling the paper for you a little bit more. If I look at the model constraint and I look at an LCR, uh, you know, Annette told us yesterday, don't worry too much about the LCR, just think about demand for money. But here's the LCR anyway, right? You have sort of like a weight times your illiquid assets plus your cash, right? That's your high quality liquid assets in an LCR. Has to be at least as big as a net outflows your experience in a stress test scenario, right? Which is essentially some weight, some other weight times your long-term debt, short-term debt, excuse me. So it's the same equation again, right? Like this is K, this is M, this is D. Right? So you kind of uh, have a model that can gives you the correct scenarios and weightings to, to calibrate an LCR, which is, which is kind of neat, you know, that it comes out so directly. It doesn't usually come out so directly, definitely from global games models and, and also not from new Keynesian models with financial frictions. So I think this is actually quite a nice thing. Uh, now let me talk a bit about the spread. So this condition you can unpack because the, the run rate, the F, or the one minus F depends on the spread. Okay, when you have a higher spread, when you're giving your short-term lenders a higher spread on their investment in you, they're less likely to withdraw, right? So you increase the funding spread in equilibrium to ease your constraint. Right? If you're on this binding constraint where you're about to face a run, you can promise people a slightly higher rate on their deposit and you get away from the run constraint. Right? So you're increasing the spread, which is here called J, I guess, to avoid distress. In more standard models, the market increases J for you when they anticipate distress. Right? This is a model where stress never happens, but you promise people money so to make sure it never happens. Right? And normally we would think of spreads as going up because people are pricing in the possibility of distress uh, in a heavier way and also maybe applying a higher risk premium to that. Right? So again, this might be a testable prediction of the model that's very different from other models and that you might want to consider to sell your story as something we need on top of uh, all the other microfinance literature. Okay, so, um, okay, so I'm probably also going to finish before time, which which is nice, because I got two minutes head start. Uh, but this is my last slide, but I'll talk a little bit more broadly around this about the contribution of the paper, okay? And this is a little bit um, intricate. I think it's written like a vanilla macro paper, at least the version I have, right? It's kind of, you, you have a theory, you plug it into a general equilibrium model, you draw some impulse responses, right? So that's a crowded space. Okay, like the, there's a lot of impulse responses of, that have been drawn since 2008 around things like capital destruction shocks, net worth shocks, all the rest of it, right? And, and the impulse response that you drew were yours versus a completely vanilla RBC model. That seems like a straw man to me, okay? I think that, you know, at least run a Gertler and Kiyotaki or something like that, you know, see, th that's, that's who you have to win against, I think, to make sure that people realize this is a new story 
something that adds to our quantitative understanding. Okay, also, I wouldn't necessarily go for a capital destruction shock because I don't know. What you saw on the impulse responses was the increased investment after a bad shock because if all you do is just randomly blow up some capital, the first thing that the agents in the model do is really quickly rebuild capital. Right? And that's completely counterfactual. Investments is one of the things that tanks the most during finan after financial crises. Right? So I think you should be hitting that, and I think you should be blowing up something else, not just, not just a capital stock. But let's see. Um, OK, so I would say a little bit about the contribution in terms of timing and nature of debt runs. I think I cannot stress enough that there's a very elegant solution to the conundrum that global games kind of feel like the right way to study bank runs but have so far been very intractable. Okay, and you've done a very good job. The trick there is to basically define a very clever variable, a very clever state variable about which people have heterogeneous information. Okay, that's kind of cheating, but to be honest, because we let the heterogeneous information go to zero anyway, when we solve the thing, it's fine because you're cheating about something that you're letting go to zero, so I don't care. Right, so I think this is very elegant, you know, and you have this, this nice equation with liquidity and leverage choice in the same place. It relates directly to the LCR, et cetera. I think that's, that's very nice. I think you can sell that much more as the core contribution of the paper. Just make sure you don't get any macro referees in that case. But I think that's, um, you know, I think that's a way to, to sell this slightly differently and maybe to a more general interest audience. So you can either go down the, you know, on the quantitative route is, is important, especially because you've also added the liquidity thing at the end. Right, so what you need to then do is maybe convince me that the liquidity thing, your IV at the end, and the rest of the story need to be in the same paper. And I think that, again, maybe they're pitched against something like Holmstrom and Tyrol, pitch it against someone that's actually thought about this before, because they have. This is just a different story based on bank runs, and that's very attractive, but, you know, I would think a bit about that. Okay, the other thing I would think about, if you're pushing more that you have a much better way to analyze bank runs than other people, which I think you do, uh, is can you get to a point where runs actually happen in equilibrium? Can there be some sudden stops? You know, you experience a shock that you just couldn't hedge against, and the run actually happens some of the time. And so you'd now have both a very clean equation for what banks do to prevent the run, at the same time as some characterizations of run when actually runs happen in the data. And that, again, makes the model more testable, and, and it, it lets the model say something that other papers aren't able to say. So I think um, I'll stop there. And uh, thanks very much again for putting me on the program. Thank you very much. Um, another prize won. Um, you may not have realized I did all this to squeeze them with time that you have more time to ask your questions. So please don't, don't disappoint me. And oh, wonderful. So I see, I think the first hand was there in the front. Please state your name and affiliation, nevertheless, even though some have may have heard it already. Right. Um, Wen Xin Du, Columbia Business School. Uh, I'm a little intrigued by the new empirical results where you show adding treasury reduces funding spreads and increases liquidity. To me, adding treasury drains cash from the system, which is the more liquid one. So it should go the other way around. Uh, I think about the treasury has to be financed and the increase the TGA actually drains bank reserves, other things being said. Let's collect two or three, no? I saw another hand in the left on that side, yeah. Hi, Mick Lojvary from uh, Banque de France. So um, actually my question will be more for uh, Ansgard. You mentioned the idea of uh, the LCR in this paper that maybe uh, that justifies liquidity regulation. What I was wondering, since you seem to have put some thought uh, around this topic, is if you had in the model a lender of last resort who commits to lend liquidity whenever there is a run, uh, my first intuition is that that would be maybe superior to the, to the LCR. Uh, that's actually a general feature. I haven't seen any model which tells you that uh, liquidity regulation is actually greater than the lender of last resort. There's, people seem to be kind of allergic to the LOLR for political reasons. So, I mean, you have some views on the literature. If you have any thought on this, that would be interesting. Thank you. There's a third question there in the front. There's a micro needed there in the second row, third row on the right. Yeah. 
Hi, Yiming Ma, Columbia Business School. Um, I'm curious about your treatment of liquid assets, of both being reserves and treasuries, because it is true that reserves are held on bank balance sheets, leading to the effects that you described, but you know, treasuries are, are not primarily held by commercial banks, right? And so if you have like a non-bank who's holding a lot of treasuries, and perhaps the non-banks is issuing uh, liabilities that then are substitutes with deposits, right? would that create an additional channel where actually the issuance of more treasuries could actually crowd out your bank deposits? I don't see any questions online, but Christian, I think then the back has a, a last question. Maybe then it's time to close. Thanks. Uh, Christian Kubica, ECB. Uh, I just want to add uh, to something that Yuming said, uh, is that you um, treat reserves and treasuries in the same way. You focus a lot then in the empirical part on treasury rates. Um, I was wondering whether uh, or what are your thoughts on using your model to quantify or understand the effects of QE or QT? So what is really the role of reserves in your model? Can, can we think about uh, the central bank increasing or decreasing the M that you have in the model and what effects will that have? Thanks. Yeah, very nice question because it would also allow us to make the transition to the next paper very nicely. So. Uh, you have an amazing amount of time to answer, but I don't encourage, a long, uh, encourage a long monologue, though. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, if it's OK, I'm going to start from the, from the end. Um, so yeah, we wanted to keep things simple in this model. And that means we have one liquid asset and one illiquid asset. And it felt OK to sort of bunch together reserves and treasuries in the liquid category. Um, but sort of if you take that seriously, you know, QE, as long as QE is literally issue reserves and uh, buy T-bills, then it wouldn't have an effect. I don't think that's really realistic. I mean, I think possibly reserves are more um, liquid than some other, uh, th than some of the treasuries, at least the long term, maybe. Uh, but yeah, we just didn't do that. It's, it wasn't uh, sort of, we thought that the additional um, complexity of the model wouldn't have been paid off by, by further insight. But, but it's a good point. Um, that is probably how we want to go about if we really want to think about QE. Um, OK, so what, um, okay, let, let me go to the TGA question. Um, so it, it is true. I mean, we actually have the balances of the TGA in the, in, as lags. It is true that, uh, so the way it works, when, you, when the government sells treasuries, it uh, sort of, in a way, banks pay it in reserves. And these reserves end up in the TGA balance uh, of, the, of the treasury. That means that there's fewer reserves for sort of financial intermediaries to hold. That is true on day one. Now, these shocks are persistent. I mean, these are innovations, right? But all, all these variables are persistent. So if we run a local projection, what happens is that the money in the TGA after sort of an innovation to treasuries gets spent pretty quickly. Not all of it, like a small fraction gets spent on day one, but we see that almost all of it is, is spent within a week. So in this sense, more treasuries increase the amount of liquid assets available to, to intermediaries within sort of, it takes a while. Um, um, okay, so I think you, you may want to... Yeah. Okay, so I, it's a good question. I think it depends on what exactly you think the market failures are. So it, in a bank run model, you know, if, if, if you think the most prominent market failure is just failure of coordination, then a lender of last resort is the optimal response, right? It, it, it's, that's what Diamond and Divic already pointed out, right? Like you might want to suspend convertibility, but that's not very palatable. So lender of last resort sounds great, or deposit insurance sounds great. All these things sounds great, because you don't actually have to use them. You just have to build a big house that says FDIC, and then nobody runs anymore because they think the FDIC is there, or, or the lender of last resort, right? But in some of the broader models, for example, with fire sales, like I said, you get the same kind of condition, but you also get an externality. And now having a lender of last resort just there would actually generate moral hazard. It would, it would make sure that people exploit the externality or co cause more externalities than before. And so that's maybe more problematic. I think, um, so it really depends on where you think the frictions are, I think. Can I follow up on this? So, um, I mean, the model is about um, sort of ex-ante liquidity in a way. Uh, and you're saying, well, what about ex-post liquidity? So, we th we're thinking about an extension. One interesting thing that I can say is that sort of it's true. Like if you know you say I'm gonna buy those illiquid assets at one, so no liquidation cost ex post, you 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 make the friction go away. 
But sort of even though this is never taken up, uh, ex ante, this has, um, this has a fiscal cost in the model because it, it, you know, the liquidity premium would go to zero, right? I mean, there's no reason then ex ante to hold any, any liquidity. Uh, so that's one interesting thing. So like ex post, um, um, lender of last resort actually has a cost in this model, even though it's never picked up. Um, so I, we, I, I thought that was interesting. Ying, would you mind r reminding me of the question? I'm really bad at this. Were you able to hear it? <laughs> yeah, 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 I was able. Um, yeah, I, I think fundamentally, uh, this is a question about sort of what are your banks? Sort of who, what institutions get into that? I think this is a bit of a, um, um, it's a difficult feature for all these macrofinance uh, uh, papers to think about um, um, what should really go in there? I mean, we are thinking uh, that, you know, the key characteristic of what should go in that category is um, institutions that do maturity transformation and therefore sort of through this mechanism, we get that liquidity crowds in investment. I think what you're saying is that, yeah, maybe not, you know, that's not a primary concern for every, for every institution and therefore for some institution may go the other way around. Yes, probably, yes, it's, I, I would have to think how to add this ingredient and uh, maybe then it's fair to do a horse race between the two. Yeah, thanks. All right, so I'm afraid you have to give your price back because oh, no, no, no. you went into the red now. <laughs> but um, okay, but it's not very much, so that's okay. Um, I hope that um, Viral is slowly coming online here. Uh, maybe we can put him on screen because we're moving to the next paper. Uh, ah, here we go. Okay, good to see you, Viral. Uh, you look good on the screen. Um, so um, the, the, the title of the paper is much too long, so it's actually impossible to read out. Uh, but I believe what, uh, he, what Viral and Raghu want to convince us is that if there's more liquidity injection, that may not lead to more liquidity, in fact, or there may some, be some countervailing effect. So actually a paper that has led to quite some discussions in the central banking world already. So um, I'm really looking forward to seeing it it presented viral, so you have uh, 25 minutes. I don't think Point we can hear you. Now. you can, can you see the screen, Philip? Uh, uh, yes, we see okay. you and the slides together beautifully. Okay, so no adjustments needed. That's all good, right? It's there. Go ahead. Okay, perfect. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for allowing me to participate uh, remotely. Uh, unfortunately, our, or fortunately, our empirical paper got onto the NBR monetary policy program, and uh, I had to sort of do double duty. So I'm up early, but I'm, I'm wide awake, and I hope I can say something interesting. Uh, so Raghu and I started uh, looking at this issue, perhaps uh, because both of us were uh, in the midst of liquidity management while in India. Uh, and we started wondering about, uh, sorry, I think I have to, there's a question to switch the full mode, right? Okay, do that. Does that address it, Stefan? Or? Yeah, it looks good, it looks good, go ahead. Okay, you're, you're okay, very good. Running. So yeah, we started asking this question of, uh, how does the central bank balance sheet alter the balance sheet of the banking system? Uh, because ultimately, if you want to know how the transmission is going to happen or happen the right way, uh, we do need to go from the central bank balance sheet to intermediary balance sheets. Uh, perhaps in the grandest version of the paper, one would also think about non-banks. But as of now, we are treating non-banks in a very reduced form manner. Uh, this is mostly about the banking system and Thanks to Silicon Valley Bank and Credit Suisse, it seems we'll still keep caring about banks for some more time. So, Okay, so uh, the real question that we started with is why is it that uh, even in a world of what seems to be large quantum of central bank reserves, the ultimate form of liquidity, as Ben Shindu just explained, uh, why is it that we are still getting these episodes of liquidity scarcity? Uh, it, it, it perhaps seems unusual that uh, 
from a world in which we used to have 20 to 50 billion dollars and manage liquidity, we now have several trillions of dollars, and yet somehow it's not enough. Uh, you know, every now and then we are getting punctuated by problems in money markets. Uh, we had the repo market spike in September 19. We had a dash for cash in March 20. Uh, we had the pension funds uh, collateral or liquidity crisis in around the fiscal problems in UK in October 22. Uh, and then perhaps topping it off all were the uninsured depositor runs based on bank solvency concerns in March of 23 in the US. Now, there is approximate cause for each of these, and you can write a separate model and a separate explanation for every single one of this. Uh, and each one, I think, has some uh, shades of its own. Uh, I think we are trying to see if there is something common that's happening to the system as a whole uh, at the level of the macro balance sheets of the banking system and the distribution of reserves within the banks. Okay, So uh, the theory we have may not necessarily be a perfect explanation for each of these episodes, but we think it has something deeper to say about why the balance sheets of the banking system have been evolving the way they are. Okay, and so we're going to start off with the assumption, unlike the most current setting in the US in which money market funds do have access to uh, parking reserves at the central bank, but we're going to assume in this model that uh, it's the commercial banks that are holding the reserves. So at least for most part of history to date, this would be a reasonable assumption. Uh, so the question is, how does the Fed expand its balance sheet or a central bank expand its balance sheet? Uh, and it can happen in two ways, uh, this mechanism. Uh, either the Fed buys directly from the commercial banks, uh, so it could be a world in which uh, essentially it's a bank-dominated uh, financial system, uh, or more in the modern advanced economy setting, uh, the central bank is also buying or primarily buying in some cases from non-banks. Okay, And it turns out this matters for the size and the way things may play out in the commercial banking world. Okay, So the first mechanism is, a, is an asset swap with banks. So in the pre-QE world on the left-hand side, uh, you know, the Fed is running some balance sheet, uh, banks are running some balance sheet, uh, and uh, uh, and there are non-banks as well. I think I'm starting with the second mechanism here first, sorry. Uh, so, so banks have some deposits, they have some treasury securities, and they are holding some reserves. Okay. Now, uh, there are also non-banks. Uh, for simplicity, their balance sheets are modeled in a in a waste uh, kind of non-leverage fashion. So they have some wealth on their right-hand side, but they have some bank deposits and they are also holding some treasury securities. So, you know, this could be insurance companies, pension funds, mutual funds, high net worth individuals, family offices, whatever it be. Okay. So uh, if, if the Fed expands its balance sheet here, it goes to the market and purchases treasury securities by a billion dollars. In the in this mechanism, where it's the non-banks that are tendering their assets to the Fed effectively via the banks. So what happens is the Fed buys the securities at the auction. Uh, the, the bank that's participating in the auction tenders uh, the securities to the Fed and gets the reserves in exchange. But actually, ultimately, the, uh, the securities were tendered to the bank by the non-banks. So the non-banks are the ones whose treasury securities are coming down, and their financial deposits are actually going up by a billion dollar at the end of the QE. Um, it turns out, uh, if you have access to Fed data, which currently I do because I'm on a sabbatical at the New York Fed. You can actually track this even at, at, at the daily level for some banks and at weekly level for a larger set of banks and see whether it's the financial deposits uh, that are actually going up when QE is done. And it turns out uh, most of the asset swap of QE happens in this manner, which is that the non-banks are tendering their assets via banks to the Fed. As a result, financial deposits go up and importantly, the bank balance sheets are expanding. Okay, So that's the point I want you to focus on, that in this version of QE, 
when central bank balance sheet expands, bank balance sheets expand by a dollar mechanically, and backing them are the reserves in the aggregate banking system as a whole. There's another way in which asset swap can happen, which is simpler, which is that banks simply tender over their treasury securities or agency securities to the Fed. And in this case, at least mechanically, there needs to be no alteration in the size of the commercial bank balance sheet. Okay? There might be some second order stimulus effects. Maybe, maybe this transformation of the asset side creates some econ economic activity. Uh, but at least me the mechanical operation of the QE need not expand the bank balance sheets. So the question is what happens in data? Uh, so in a parallel paper that I was mentioning, I'm presenting later today here, uh, what we show is that when reserves expand in the system, it does seem to be the case that the deposits in the system go up. So the reserves here are in the blue line relative to GDP. The vertical lines are the various phases of central bank waxing and waning of the balance sheet. Uh, in the first three rounds of QE, as the reserves go up, the deposits are going up as well. Of course, it takes a little bit more to establish that there is some causation link here. And importantly, when the reserves are coming down in the passive phase after QE of the balance sheet and then active quantitative tightening, which is QT1, you see that the deposits stay sort of relatively flat. Uh, then you have the pandemic uh, QE when the reserves in the system are expanding massively, and you can see this huge surge in the deposits. Uh, if you drill down further, you can show that it's not all coming from the fiscal stimulus. There is actually a piece linked to the QE as well. And then, of course, from March uh, in, in 22 onwards, the deposits actually started shrinking, ultimately ending in runs. Uh, furthermore, if you divide the deposits into insured and uninsured deposits, uh, just focus on the demandable deposits at the top here. Uh, the thick line is the uninsured demandable deposits and the dashed line is the insured demandable deposits. Uh, in the initial phase, both are growing in the first rounds of QE and they both stabilize. But especially at the time of pandemic QE, the continuing increase of deposits with QE is actually that in the uninsured uh, deposits, and then ultimately they correct uh, in a big way. So uh, at some level in the central banking world, this is now almost accepted as given, which is that when the central banks expand, the commercial bank balance sheets expand too. Uh, when we started out the work, perhaps there was a little bit of uncertainty about this assertion, but at least now this seems to be proved in a variety of central banking data all over the world. Uh, but importantly, it looks like there's some hysteresis that once banks expand their balance sheets, they are not keen to reverse them uh, fully. Uh, at least this didn't happen in the 17 to 19 uh, QT period. Uh, so we are trying to build a micro model that explains this, like uh, what happens in bank preferences on their balance sheets, and why might there be some fragility associated with this creation of a stock of uninsured demandable deposits in the system. And our explanation is going to be that once the reserves are injected, even if in the banking system as a whole they are backing deposits one for one, the distribution of reserves in the banking system afterwards may not necessarily line up with where the demand or where the demandability of the deposits is. And for this not to be a problem, it has to be the case that the interbank market works beautifully uh, and, you know, under simple assumptions, you can break that. Uh, and therefore, this creation of a stock of demandable claims in the system may be a problem because you are dealing with a larger stock of demandable liabilities, okay? And so that's our main conclusion that, that we should think about stability or fragility consequences of QE because it's not just an expansion of central bank balance sheet, it's actually an expansion of the commercial bank balance sheets and importantly with uninsured demandable claims. Okay, so the basic model uh, to, to tie it up nicely it takes a little bit of work. Uh, we have firms, banks, investors, because banks are lending to some entities in the economy that pins down their overall intermediation size. Uh, 
they are raising some deposits and equity, so there have to be some investors. And importantly, there has to be some heterogeneity in the banking system, even if just exposed through some realized shocks, because you want to think about an interbank market that will shuffle around these reserves to where the demandable claims are running. Uh, so uh, we organize the model at the, as these bank firm pairs, which are regionally or sectorally matched. Uh, firm and bank owners in the model are risk neutral. They are expected profit maximizers. So nothing dramatic happens through them uh, demanding liquidity themselves. Uh, firms will have some liquidity demand, which is that they make some initial investments uh, invest So this is like a Holmstrom to roll sort of a setup. They make some investment at date zero. They have some initial wealth, but they will still get some term loans. On the margin, the term loans are going to go into their own cash deposits at banks. And when they get hit by some shocks at an interim date one, they may also be drawing down on these cash deposits from their relationship banks. So the firm deposits are D0 with the a superscript F at the top. Uh, now, the most important balance sheet is that of the banks. Uh, so at date zero, they have some long-term assets, which are these term loans to banks. Uh, we are going to assume that they are uh, illiquid at uh, date one, but that there is enough for them to pay off the claims uh, at date two. Uh, and they may be holding some liquid reserves as zero, uh, this is going to be determined, the size of this is going to be determined by the central bank. Only the central bank can control the aggregate quantity of reserves in this model uh, and therefore with the banks in this model because there is no reverse repo facility that can have reserves moving over to non-banks uh, or money market funds in particular. For now, we'll assume that at date one, there is something that happens which takes out a part of these reserves. Uh, the most natural interpretation is that a quantitative tightening is going to happen at date one, and that's going to be for a proportion of the reserves tau in the model. Uh, you can model it as a constant quantity. It doesn't alter the results uh, qualitatively. Okay, so uh, the question then is, if this S0 is going to expand the bank balance sheet the way I described it, how will the banks finance the reserves on their expansion? Uh, so they can raise uninsured deposits, uh, and there's an unlimited stock of this in the model. Uh, the simplest way of thinking about it is that it could just be an asset swap. Uh, and the other way is that they can raise some equity capital. Uh, equity in this model is just a claim that doesn't run at date one. So if you want, this can even be your franchise of core deposits. Uh, the important part is that to raise more of it, there is some convex cost of uh, issuing them, whether it's a due diligence cost or whether it's your franchise cost of maintaining branches, it doesn't matter so much in the model. Okay. So then with some probability, there's a stressed state of the world in which some of these firm bank pairs uh, up to a proportion theta by law of large numbers get affected. Firms are now going to have to rescue their investments, but more importantly, the depositors who are very stressed, uh, and we assume there's sort of like a Stein 2012 style extreme risk aversion, that these depositors are also going to run on the bank. Okay, so what's the exact mechanic that's at work? Your firms are getting affected, they are drawing down on the bank, so it's like a, the tech sector drawing down deposits on Silicon Valley Bank. And seeing that the depositors who are extremely risk averse say now there is a small chance of an insolvency at day two, even though there's no expected insolvency at day two, but because these depositors are extremely risk averse, they'll precipitate a run at date one itself. Okay? Now the run is then a claim on the reserves of the bank, but a fraction tau of the reserves have now gone out. So the firm bank pairs which are distressed are now going to get depositor runs and a scarcity of liquidity. So where, do, where can they get the reserves to settle their deposits? They have to either go in the interbank market or they have to raise more equity. What's raising more equity in the model? It's a conversion of someone else's deposit claims into an equity claim. Okay. 
So that is going to be also a transfer of reserves from surplus banks to the needy banks. So either surplus banks can lend to the needy banks in the interbank market, or the needy banks can issue equity, which in the aggregate is the conversion of someone's deposits claims into an equity claim. And as long as those depositors are with surplus banks, there'll be some transfer of reserves that takes place with equity issuance. We're going to assume it's one for one. It may be even less than that if it's your own depositors who are converting claims into equity, but we're going to assume it's all coming from the surplus banks out there. Okay, now importantly, uh, we're going to assume that uh, you know there's some market rate R1 in the interbank market. Uh, there's some quantity of equity that's going to be raised E1. There'll be a convex cost of that, so there'll be a marginal cost of equity capital issuance. And in equilibrium, these two rates have to match, which is that the equity issuance rate on the margin is the same as the interbank rate at which the reserves will get lent. Okay. Uh, so we're going to assume that for, to start with just exogenously that there's a fraction fee of banks uh, that's willing to lend in the interbank market and a fraction one minus fee, think of this as JP Morgan, it just wants to maintain a fortress balance sheet and not have its reserve balances going down during the day and they are going to forego lending but they're going to now get flight to safety deposits. Okay, So in, ultimately we endogenize this fee and that's going to be the trade-off between these two decisions. Do I lend in the interbank market and allow my reserve balances to go down and in the process give up the flight to safety deposits or do I just remain like a JP Morgan on the side, getting all the flight to safety deposits and giving up my high uh, interbank market returns? Okay, so that's the additional wrinkle in the model, which is that the stress banks are getting money in the interbank market from what we are calling as tainted banks, a fraction fee of them. But the flight to safety is then removing those reserves back to the safe bank uh, and the safe banks are now growing and there's some advantage to them from doing that because they've become disproportionately large, even though ex ante all banks are identical in the model. So market, there's some market power gain on reserves or deposits at the end of the day when this happens. Okay, so uh, I won't go through the exact optimization problems. Firms are uh, like in Holmstrom Tirol doing some management of liquidity shocks. Banks are doing some capital structure optimization. The key equation is actually the budget uh, condition of the bank, which is that on the right hand side, they have deposits and equity in their capital structure. On the left-hand side, they are intermediating loans. We have some intermediation costs to pin down the size of the balance sheet. But there's this talk of reserves that the central bank is supplying that they need to finance. Okay. Uh, the key, so, so that's at date zero. And the way this model works is that everyone anticipates what's going to happen in the stress state of the world at date one. Is the world going to be in a in a in a in a state of interbank friction? So the rate R1 is going to be above normal. Uh, so there's going to be some interbank liquidity premium, some equity issuances taking place, which are then going to pin down the interbank premium. Or is there, is there going to be so much surplus liquidity that actually the interbank rate will be pinned down to no premium and no equity issuances will be taking place uh, in the model? Okay. So that key condition that pins down the equilibrium rate R1 is the following, which is that the market for spot loans at date one has to clear at a going interbank rate R1. But the stressed, the stressed banks and the ones that are arbitraging in the interbank market, they have a need or a benefit to issuing equity. So they will incur equity issuance costs. Uh, and then uh, there is a cross-market arbitrage that pins these rates down. Okay, So what is that arbitrage condition? This is the core of the model in some sense. Uh, you have some equity issuances taking place. That's the additional liquidity being raised via date one capital issuances. So that's by the theta banks which are hit and the one minus theta times fee banks which are in the interbank market. There's some net demandable claims running on the stress banks in the system. How large is that? That's theta times the new demand for investment from the firms that are hit by this Holmstrom to roll shocks. 
and the risk averse depositor runs that's taking place. Okay, so the tech sector and the uninsured depositors are running at the same time. Uh, and then there is some liquidity of reserves in the system, but a fraction one minus tau that was not with the uh, stressed banks and with the interbank active banks is now disappeared from the system. Okay, so the reserves of the JP Morgan are not in the system, and, and a fraction of the QT reserves that were taken out are also not in the system anymore. Okay, now why is this equation important? Because it actually captures the two key forces in the model, okay, which is that if you just jack up reserves somehow, the S0 gets increased as an exogenous shock without altering the size of the bank balance sheet at date zero, then of course, if you increase S0, it has a negative effect on the equilibrium interbank rate, R1, which is being determined on the left-hand side, okay? So the sign in front of S0 is negative. That's the standard intuition that when you do QE, you are injecting reserves, the world hasn't changed. It's just somehow that the central bank changed the stock of reserves, and so the interbank rates have come down. Okay, but what the point of the model is that, no, no, not quite, because how are you altering the stock of reserves at date zero? The banking system changed itself. And in fact, in the model, there's a one for one increase in the stock of deposits with reserves because equity issuances are costly, whereas wholesale deposits are just going at the going rate of zero in the model at date zero. So deposits at date zero increase one for one, and therefore now there's a trade-off because these deposits are a demandable claim with some probability and on a part of the system uh, at date one. Okay. So the key intuition is, is the injection of reserves at date zero, how much surplus liquidity does it create? And does it always create surplus liquidity or not? Okay. And we have this main condition of the model that if the size of the shock is large, which is a big, a big proportion of the system theta gets affected, if QT is going to be large, which is that a big part of the reserves got taken out before this shock arose uh, by a fraction tau, and if not many banks fee are active in the interbank market, so if theta is large, fee is small, and tau is large, then you can get that you get stress, and R1, which is this interbank rate at date one, can actually be abnormally high. There'll be liquidity scarcity, and therefore a capital scarcity uh, in the system, in the model, okay? So the, the way the model is written, the insolvency happens at date two with some probability, but that's enough to precipitate a run uh, at date one because of the extreme risk aversion of depositors. Okay, just a couple of uh, quick points as to what we do then in the model. Uh, there, are, uh, there are a few extensions that are important. We do endogenize this interbank market uh, uh, act, uh, active share. Uh, there's a simple way to do it, which is to just assume that whichever bank becomes bloated as a result of the fragility, typically it's been JP Morgan in the last 15 years, that it earns some convenience yield on these reserves. It can You can think of it as market power on deposits, or if you want, it's a convenience sealed on reserves. And this means that they would rather sit as a fortress. And then in the model, we endogenize what fraction fee sits, uh, goes in the interbank market and one minus fee sits as a fortress. Okay, uh, that's one. Uh, second, we endogenize the reserve shrinkage tau, okay, which is that we, we endogenize uh, or at least sketch how can it be that when the central bank engages in QT, it's shrinking reserves, but banks don't want to shrink their balance sheets. And what we show now, we just realized this, um, yeah, I have to come to an end. We just realized this last week that the same force that makes commercial bank balance sheets expand during QE, which is that banks want a larger balance sheet. They want an extra deposit for an extra reserve. It's the same force which is going to prevent them from shrinking their balance sheet when QT happens, because they actually don't want to lose a deposit for a loss of reserve. And so we show in the model, I haven't had a chance to go through this, that there's some force which ensures that the that commercial banks will expand during QE, but then not uh, shrink their balance sheets during QT. They'll shrink their reserves, but they'll just do an asset swap uh, with the central bank and get uh, securities instead. Uh, 
Okay, so I'll stop here. Uh, this is a model in which fragility happens because of the total size of uh, the reserves as zero. If reserves as zero become very large, the uninsured demandable deposits become very large, but not all of the reserves are available to move around in the system. Okay, so let me stop there and I look forward to hearing your comments. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. We are a bit squeezed on time, a liquidity shortage on time. Uh, so the discussion is Will Diamond, one of the upcoming young scholars from the Wharton School at UPenn. Wait until I see the slides. It's this button. Here we go. Great. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to discuss this really interesting paper and for having me out to the ECB. It's my first time here. It seems like a wonderful place. And I also am being a little short on listing the whole title of the paper. That's the first line. Um, I didn't include the whole thing. Um, but I really enjoyed reading this paper. And let me quickly summarize what it's trying to do, which is a, it's a model of the impact of central bank reserve injections on financial stability. So there's other parts of QE in terms of the yield curve, you know, treasury supply, which is not modeled here. But what the paper's really trying to do is understand in a nice model with good institutionally relevant frictions, if we add reserves to the bank balance sheets, how does the commercial banking sector respond to this? And in what conditions might this actually have counterproductive effects on uh, stability? Now, the Econ 101 benchmark here is if there's a supply for liquidity and a demand for liquidity, and we supply more liquidity, the demand will be satiated, and there will be fewer liquidity crises. Now, that can still happen under some conditions in this model, but because we endogenize the choices of bank balance sheets over a wide range of dimensions, once the liquidity of these reserves are injected into the system, the banking system can become quote unquote dependent on that liquidity through its endogenous choice of capital structure, making stability more of an issue going forward. So there's two frictions in this paper which really lead to this possibility, and they both are emphasized in Varel's talk. One is that banks supply more deposits after reserve injections, which are hard to unwind later. And what this gives you is a notion of path dependence, where if I do injections through QE right now, I take out reserves through QT later, that does not net out to a zero total effect because the banking system now has more liabilities which require the liquidity on balance sheet. The second thing is what happens in a banking crisis. So when bank health is uncertain and different depositors might be worrying about where they are or are not going to lose their money, they likely are going to run to the sort of heavily regulated, strong balance sheet, large, too big to fail banks. And as a result, you might have a mismatch of which banks have the reserves and which banks need the reserves. I think we saw this in the Silicon Valley crisis where lots of reserve rich banks sitting in the center, deposits are being reallocated out of other banks into those, whereas in a frictionless world, the aggregate liquidity supply in the banking system could potentially be reallocated to possibly prevent some runs. And the paper models both of these really nicely, and that's what leads to these interesting counterintuitive results where we have an increase of the liquidity supply making the risk of severe liquidity crises worse. OK, so a quick overview of the model itself. There's going to be firms and banks. So firms have a project initially, and it's going to get a payoff at the end of time if everything goes well. The more I invest, the larger my payoff. But what's going to make things interesting is that time one, in between the beginning at zero and the end at two, the project could potentially fail, and the firm gets a chance to rescue the project. So if the firm invests I1 at time one, it's going to get an amount of output G1 of that, which is increasing in the amount invested. So I start with an initial investment. If I'm in trouble, I lose that initial investment, but I have an opportunity to sort of come back and invest a second time. This generates a precautionary demand for deposits, and this also leads to the, the banks who lend to these firms when the projects blow up are going to have a bad shock. And because of that, there can potentially be a run on that bank. So the banks then who lend to these firms are also going to hold an exogenous supply of reserves supplied by the central bank. They provide these loans with a quadratic cost, which makes them a little bit sticky to adjust. And then they're going to finance this with deposits, which they can adjust flexibly, and equity, which also goes go, going to have an adjustment cost. Now, because of this, when you inject more reserves into the system, the most flexible way of adjusting is to add more deposits. So $1 more reserves, $1 more deposits. All the lending and equity issuance costs are held fixed. And that's why we have in the model that reserve injections lead to this expansion of bank balance sheets with more deposits coming in. So unlike reserves, deposit quantities here are endogenously chosen. And as the reserve injections happen, that's how we get this response of this levering up and expansion of bank balance sheets. 
So at time one, there's either going to be a good or a bad shock. The good shock, nothing interesting happens, everything, none of the projects fail, and there's no runs. When there's a bad shock, because each bank lends to only one firm, some fraction of the banks now have this disaster where they've lost a large share of their balance sheet, and they can potentially experience runs. And what's going to make things interesting here is that a fraction only of the healthy, ban of the, uh, healthy banks are going to uh, participate in the interbank market. Now, again, kind of like the Silicon Valley example I talked about, some banks are in trouble, some banks are healthy. And of the healthy banks, some say, I do not want to enter the interbank market and solve this problem, because by staying out, I can convince depositors I am super, super safe, and you might as well pull your money out and run to me instead. And that leads to a mismatch between where the liquidity exists and where the liquidity is needed. So if there's a crisis, even if aggregate liquidity is enough, to solve all the issues, because of this issue of depositors not knowing where to put their money and this sort of signaling idea of wanting to keep your balance sheet strong, that's how we can have larger reserve injections leading to runs actually being worse ex post. OK, so my first comment on this is there's an implicit notion of dynamics in this. So the model is simple but very sort of institutionally relevant and realistic, and that's how we can kind of tell informally a very subtle and complex story with nice tractable math. Um, but what the paper is really emphasizing here is the notion of how deposits are building up during booms and being taken out during busts. And there's other papers which have talked about related things, which is deposits tend to flow into banks at low interest rates and flow out of banks at high interest rates because of the substitution between cash and deposits. Deposits are sort of a worse deal when nominal interest rates are high. And one thing we see recently in this tightening cycle is rates have risen really, really fast. We've knocked out a whole bunch of the banking system, but the substitution channel seems to be a little bit slower than usual. So the path dependence in this paper, I think, so the paper is accepted in a journal now. I'm not going to nitpick on small details. But I think it's raising this broad issue for the literature that we really need to understand dynamics and state dependence in terms of how deposit quantities move. So uh, let me just quickly show a raw picture. This is from the recent tightening cycle in the US. Usually there's like ballpark half of the increase in the Fed's funds rates passes through to savings deposit rates. Here it looks like it's effectively nothing, which I think tells you that the speed of tightening really matters and not just the level of interest rates. Uh, and I think the details of this are complex, but the fact that this is true, I think you can just sort of see very quickly in the data. Um, let me just quickly get back to the sort of more micro details of my thoughts here. So Viral has another paper showing empirically that he mentioned that aggregate deposit quantities seem to be responding to quantitative easing and quantitative tightening. I have some related work with Yi Ming where actually we find a slightly different conclusion, which is that uh, the crowding out of lending to firms is also very important. So there's multiple dimensions in which a bank can adjust their balance sheet. So a bunch of reserves get thrown into the system, and the bank has to figure out what do I do. I could raise equity, but that's very costly. I could raise more deposits, that's what this paper finds. I could lend less to firms, that's what we find is somewhat of the response. Or related to some of Wenshin's work, I could say the synthetic dollar lending I'm doing in the CIP deviation market, I could say, well, reserves are crowding that out instead, and I might adjust my arbitrage trades instead. So I find the paper plausible and interesting here, but there's a laundry list of different ways bank balance sheets adjust as shocks because banks are so complicated in the modern world. And I think to understand how severe the mechanism they has in mind, we have to have some sense of for each dollar of reserves, how much substitution is there in these various dimensions. And I think there's sort of some difficulty of coming to consensus about that in the literature. Um, and it's really important to understand this idea of sort of attention and switching costs here, because it might be the case that for a small shock, we identify a relatively low elasticity, and that's sort of behind some of our empirical results. Whereas for a large shock, like the crises they're studying here, uh, you actually might find these large responses, which would be more in line with the theory paper here. So for the literature, I think that's sort of something which needs to be understood. Um, the model then extends to have both an asymmetry between QE, the injection of reserves, and then QT, the withdrawal of reserves. In the version of the draft I was looking at, basically what happens is there's reserves S0, tau S0, some fraction of that are taken out, and then in reduced form, a fraction tau D S0 of that is a reduction in deposits, where there is a difference between the two. So reserves go down by a dollar, maybe deposits go down by 50 cents or something, and there's this remaining gap in the balance sheet which needs to be filled. So the bank needs to rebalance from holding reserves to other assets, and what happens here is the bank is going to be holding securities instead in their model. 
And because securities are less liquid than reserves, you can't sort of reallocate them so easily by lending them in the interbank market. If we first inject reserves, lead to this big growth in deposits, then we withdraw reserves, the aggregate supply of liquidity on the asset side of the balance sheet shrinks, but the liabilities with the deposits are effectively stuck there. And that makes the financial crisis worse if we hadn't done QE or QT in the first place. And this actually gets back to a notion of dynamics. Of what we really need to understand here is the dynamic process by which when you do policy over time, banks first expand and then they contract. And I find the idea here really interesting and thought provoking. I think empirically this is complicated, hard to identify, but as a sort of checklist for the literature, this is something we really need to understand too. It's precisely this kind of state dependence that makes things matter. And what we need to know is to what extent do depositors keep their money in a bank due to adjustment costs after that went in in the first place. And I think what makes this a little bit complicated is there's multiple types of deposits here. We could think that there's retail deposits, which are slow and sticky, slow to enter, slow to leave. There might be wholesale deposits, uninsured deposits, which are fast to enter and fast to leave. And what I haven't quite figured out is, do we need there to be a type of deposit which is fast to enter and slow to leave? Or is enough for their mechanism to just have this heterogeneity of different types, where the sl sleepy people gradually enter as the stimulus becomes stronger and stronger, and then when there's a sharp tightening, the wholesale money runs out and then their mechanism holds? Or do we really need it to be the case, which I think is a little bit tougher, to have some notion of the asymmetry of sometimes people are sleepy, sometimes they're awake within a subclass of deposits? Uh, and I think the paper sort of is, you know, high level, abstract, and doesn't zoom into these details, but for the literature going forward, I think this is a question we'd like to know something about. The last thing I'm going to talk about is the paper's normative implications, where it has a really interesting and kind of counterintuitive, at least at first to me, notion of what the externality is. So Jeremy has papers based on fire sales, where why do we think that there's an inefficiency, why we need to do financial stability. I get in trouble, I have to sell my assets, that pushes down the mark to market price. That's going to affect your bank regulation, uh, your sort of uh, collateral constraints too, and therefore you might want to regulate ex ante. Things actually kind of go the opposite direction here, where the friction here is about entry into the interbank market. Where what's going to go on is imagine that there's a really high interest rate, lots of money to be made by doing these interbank loans to save the failing banks. That's going to say, I don't care if I scare my depositors and I don't get these inflows, I'm going to pick up the free money on the table. And for every bank that does that, they're going to bid down the equilibrium interest rate on interbank lending. The free money is not going to look quite as attractive. And what's going to happen then is other banks on the side will say, well, now actually the spread between a risk-free interbank rate and the rates at which I borrow is not so attractive anymore. I'd rather sit out on the sideline and therefore get the flight to quality flows from, from depositors pulling out of the risky banks and coming to me instead. And this actually tells you the banking system in certain sense should be taking more liquidity risk, not less. Um, and that, I think, potentially depends upon the details of the assumptions here, but I want to just point out that the actual frictions here are unique and counterintuitive and tell us some interesting stuff about what it's really about is incentivizing banks to lend in the interbank market is the inefficiency exposed in a crisis. So the paper does this in a fairly reduced form way. And what I'd like to know about this in more detail, maybe in additional work by people in this room, is how exactly does this stigma in a crisis work? Is it the case, for example, that if these interbank loans before they're kind of scary, and as more people enter, sure, the interest rate goes down, but the degree we scare people goes down too? We could easily flip that result potentially and then lead to sort of crowding into interbank lending. And if I know everybody else is saving the bad banks, I want to help save them too. Um, but because things are sort of reduced form here with the sort of amount of stigma of lending, that's being held fixed. I think this makes a sense a lot in terms of understanding what happened in the Silicon Valley bank crisis and its aftermath, where what seemed to be happening is these small banks, which might not be so too big to fail, had outflows of deposits, which then went to the big banks. Even though the big banks were not paying attractive interest rates at all, I showed you there's effectively zero savings accounts rates that this banking system was paying. And what could potentially be going on here is that regulation might have something to do with this. It's reduced form in the paper, but I'm inclined to say that these big banks who are too big to fail could potentially understand, I don't want to save these failable banks because I need to keep my regulatory capital requirements aligned. 
And there might be a sense in which actually this is not just about QE, QT, monetary tightening, but actually some sense in which we need to think about whether ex post we should let the private sector do some bailouts if the public sector doesn't want to do them on their own. The last thing I want to mention is uh, the model, I think, also implies that if you do the COVID checks, which led to a huge increase in deposit supply, that might have some financial stability implications too. So I have a paper showing that this has something to do with, you know, there's so much nominal liquidity that leads to inflation for sort of standard monetarist reasons and caused a housing boom. But this paper, if I interpret that episode in their model, says because the deposit increase here might actually be even bigger than some quantitative EDFCs and events, it might have some persistent negative effects on financial stability that are even worse. Uh, so let me quickly conclude. This paper presented a simple and tractable, mo tractable model of the downsides of reserve supply for financial stability. It models rather reduced form, some interesting ways that there's this dynamic sort of state dependence and how monetary transmission works. Understanding empirically how that is is, I think, really important for the literature going forward. And just big picture, as the complexity of central bank policy grows, more regulations, more different ways of injecting things, we need to understand more and more micro details of how these frictions work to do it well. And the other possibility would be, as was raised yesterday, this notion of Mari Kondoing our policy regime, simplify it, only keep things that maintain joy, and therefore we actually don't have to know exactly the details of how every little bit of plumbing works to miss these unintended consequences consequences. Thank you, Will. Um, I'm afraid I have to literally eat into your lunchtime a little bit, at least. So um, the floor is open for you. Questions? I don't have questions online at present. So, uh, Matthias, hello. Um, hi, Matthias Dreamer from the BIS. Uh, I have two questions for, for you, Viral. Uh, one is, you always, you know, the introduction is you, you say, you know, you buy assets from non-banks. And then essentially, but later in the model, you talk the bank has to finance the reserves with, um, with, with deposits. So if I think about in the moment, the central bank buys these non-bank assets, it automatically creates reserves and deposits on the, the, the bank's balance sheet because the non-bank can't have reserves. So the question is then, why does the non-bank actually continue to hold these deposits and rather buy something else? So which is, maybe it's the same in equilibrium, but I would be just interested in your thoughts. And then you mentioned, and Will talked about it as well, this asymmetric reaction, you know, once you shrink QT and you said that there's a sluggish response by deposits and it's simply because the bank does an asset swap. So it keeps part of the QT, if I understand you correctly, but maybe you can just expand a bit more because this asymmetry in the data is very puzzling and, and the model would think initially, you know, it should be symmetric. There's another question there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation. I want to expand a bit on the previous uh, previous question. So I was also wondering to what extent you introduced in the beginning this mechanical effect of buying assets from non-banks and thereby creating deposits versus like the more endogenous effect by expanding the balance sheet. You also incentivize banks to, to create loans, which create deposits. What is this distinction is important for your model? Okay, okay, so I take one more, uh, so more eating into the lunch, but uh, then we are, we're done. Uh, then is only the answer left. You made me feel so bad now, but okay. Um, I was wondering, so the, the key thing is that when some banks get into trouble, some of the others, your JP Morgan, want to hoard re liquidity instead, which kind of fits SVB really well, but then SVB wasn't a systemic crisis, right? It was relatively small. So I'm wondering if there's a non-linearity here, where if things get really bad, if there's you know, a large proportion of banks are in trouble, maybe nobody can really afford to hoard liquidity anymore. And, and maybe the arbitrage you can do by, by lending to some of the stressed ones becomes too attractive. So I was wondering how you, it's a bit outside the model, but, but how you would think about that. Yeah, I, let me add really quickly uh, something uh, to these things. So, so maybe you can comment also, Viral, on uh, what all this implies for um, a potential action as a, a lender, a liquidity provider of last resort by central bank, ex post. So, okay, try to be concise, if you may, to the benefit of our lunch breakers. Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Will, for a very great discussion. I'll come back to Will's comments maybe at the end. Uh, just start with the questions that were asked first. 
so Matthias, your question is a good one. Uh, so what happens in the model is that the first round of transaction happens with non-banks, but we give banks effectively the ability to optimize the capital structure if they want. So even though the deposit comes first from the non-banks, they can go out and raise equity. And what happens in general equilibrium in these banking models when equity is raised is that equity raising has to happen at the expense of deposits if you want it to matter. If just some equity holders are buying other equity, uh, that, that doesn't uh, sort of change anything in the model. So that's the way to think about it, which is that uh, banks can re-optimize their capital structure after the first round has happened. But then you asked, why don't non-banks? Uh, why should non-banks hold the deposit? So it could also happen from that side. So maybe non-banks then engage in maturity transformation. They buy corporate bonds. The, uh, the their deposit then gets converted into corporate deposit. The corporate may not want to hold cash. Maybe they go and make investments. They pay salaries. The salaries then go into bank accounts. The assumption in the model is that when reserves happen after all these round of optimizations, there is still a creation of deposits. Now, whether it's the financial deposit initially, it's the corporate deposit in the round one, whether it's a retail uninsured deposit in round two, uh, we don't have much to say on that because we don't have those amplification mechanisms. And that's an important point, which is that if QE is actually creating some amplifier, then the stock of deposits may even increase more than one for one with reserves. And then it's even easier to get fragility. Note that in the model, the way it's structured, deposits can only increase one for one in our benchmark model. In an extension, we have a sort of reserve requirement that gets relaxed when you inject reserves. And then there's a multiplier of deposits that gets created. Then it's even easier to get fragility. Uh, I think I think the lending point is quite important, and this will also allow me to discuss the point that Will mentioned, which is that I didn't stress this, but in the model, there is a contraction that happens in the real lending. And the way it happens is that when QE is very large, it will be the case that equilibrium inter interbank rate at date one rises, that's R1. So when R1 increases, the rollover risk on deposit increases, so term premia have to increase because the bank optimally says, it rationalizes that, yeah, if I take on a deposit, there's a rollover R1 cost at date one with some probability. So if I'm making a term loan to the corporation, I have to factor that into the term premium. And actually the lending therefore decreases because firms demand fewer quantity of term loans. What happens in the model is that the way it's written, the size of your lending book doesn't affect the likelihood of the run. Uh, and that's the reason why it doesn't play any role except that QE, when it destabilizes at date one, it also has a muted economic impact at date zero because it actually shrinks this, which is very much consistent with the result that Will, Yiming, and uh, Zhang Yang have in their excellent paper, which, uh, which, which perhaps preceded some of what we have done. Um, uh, a couple of other points that were asked. Uh, yeah, SVB was not systemic, but what's going to happen is that if the shock happens to a larger part of the system, then there is also a bigger flight to quality flow into JP Morgan. So it depends on how you think of the convenience yield. If, if the market power from becoming super abnormally large is very high, then it's not the case that JP Morgan will want to start lending. They'll say if 30% runs are taking place, I'm going to become 30% larger. And so the benefit of that is also increasing because our convenience yield is modeled on each unit of extra deposit rather than even if it's diminishing returns to scale, you know, as long as it's increasing, that's still going to be uh, the case in the model. Uh, I think it's a great idea to think about fiscal stimulus in this kind of a setup. Uh, we haven't done it yet, but I think the model has a lot of ingredients to make it work. Because you have firms, you can model the fiscal stimulus via some tax collections of the government on the corporate output. Uh, and then that could be getting injected into the system as deposit. So you can actually close the model and start looking at it. But Will's intuition is exactly right, which is that if there's an exogenous stock of deposits that you create, uh, and it's just going to be some lump sum taxation on the corporate sector, which for simplicity you can assume doesn't affect anything else, you will actually increase fragility in this model. Uh, now, fiscal stimulus may have some amplifier effects, then you have to build those in to do some kind of welfare analysis. One last point uh, I think which is interesting is that uh, why do we get this 
Uh, so I didn't realize this until the last couple of weeks, but uh, it's actually the case that what, what looks like an asymmetry between QE and QT is actually not an asymmetry. So let me just take two minutes if I can just say this, Philip, uh, which is that it looks like in QE, the transaction is happening with non-banks. So non-banks are tendering. And in QT, banks are swapping their reserves uh, for, for securities. What is symmetric about both of these is that banks don't want to contract their balance sheets. Okay, In QE, they are expanding their balance sheets, and in QT, they don't want to shrink it. So they are always choosing to have an extra unit of deposit, if they can, in their balance sheet, either by acquiring reserves in QE or by swapping reserves for securities in QT. And it turns out that they ignore the fragility because they don't realize that they are all collectively taking on deposits is creating fragility in the first place. But they realize that if I have an extra unit of reserves, I can park it around in the system with some probability and become actually uh, uh, either the acquirer of flight to quality or the interbank market abnormal gains uh, in the case. So actually, it turns out in the model that what looks like asymmetric mechanical operation of QE and QT is a symmetric response of the banks not to shrink their balance sheet size. Last point, and uh, I'll absolutely stop with that, which is I think the main policy implication of this model as I see it, it may not be the best model to do capital requirements analysis because we don't have the kind of effects that Stein 2012 has, for example. But one thing that I have been thinking about through my experience at Reserve Bank of India is that uh, we implemented liquidity coverage ratio more as a band, which is that it's not a daily requirement. It's to be implemented over a fortnight. And surplus banks can actually deviate from 100% up to 80% if they want or, or 90%. And we vary this band based on the condition of the interbank markets. So, what, so effectively what that does is that surplus banks are allowed to do arbitrage and then within a fortnight, they still have to come back to an average of 100%. Okay, and so that makes the reserves a little bit more mobile. It's not going to be a perfect solution because the convenience seal will still be at work. Uh, but at least in practice, it could be that if reserves are getting held up for regulatory reasons, then you can relax that by having a fortnightly averaging of these liquidity coverage ratios rather than requiring them be met every single night because then you run into this good art problem that there are taxis at the station, but there always has to be one taxi and therefore no one can use it. Yeah, thank you so much, Will. That was really a great and transparent discussion. It gives me some thoughts also to improve our exposition in the paper. Thanks so much. Very good, excellent. So uh, that's not fair to say that's my last point, and then now it's really my last point, and then now it's really, really my last point. So, but anyway, so I think we saw a great, had a great session, two wonderful papers, and very good discussion. So we should thank all the speakers with a resounding round of applause.